fruit of the spirit we've been doing a whole series on it and uh, today's our final uh, series message on it as we look at self-control and uh, I thought uh, put a bit of a music there to remind us of the, all the different fruits that we've been touching base about uh, but uh, today as I said we're going to focus focus on self-control again I want to remind you as we've been speaking about the fruit of the spirit it's not a to-do list uh, it's not that we need to be more loving or more. It's actually a results list as we hang out with Jesus, as we as we spend time with him, as we dwell in his word and become more like him, then the fruit by default is what we actually uh, grow. These nine attributes that we've been looking at um, are the nine things that uh, we've been focusing on, which we'll, we'll recap in just a second. But let's pray as we begin to look at uh, the final fruit of the spirit of self-control. Let's pray. Well, Father God, we thank you that uh, throughout this series we've been unpacking the different attributes of the fruit of the Spirit, that, Lord, together make up the fruit of the Spirit, not individual but together. And, Lord, I pray that as we look at this uh, final one of self-control, that, Father God, that you would speak to us and minister to us. And, Lord, as we know that this is an area that for many people it's a challenge. So we just ask that this would be a fruit that we would uh, be producing as we continue to walk with you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just to recap, at the start of the series, we talked about the bad fruit. And uh, we looked particularly at Galatians 5.19 and we talked about uh, the fact that uh, there's a whole bunch of bad fruit there. Um, but what we have is, the, is, is these, uh, let's just jump in here, the bad fruit. It says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasure, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarrelling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, wild parties and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we talked about the fact that this is the, the, the bad list. This is the, if you want to live your life anti-God, then that's what you sort of be doing. And uh, this is not how you should be living your life. And I want to say that as we talk about this, that, that if you've fallen in any one of these areas, it's not like directly go to hell sort of thing. Okay. This is what Paul's talking about here is this is a habit of sin. If you're living your life and that's the fruit that you're bearing, if that's the thing you're producing, of these things of the sinful nature, then that's not God's way. But what we actually have, as we said, is the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And as I said today, we're talking about self-control. And this is the production of people who are following Jesus, not the bad fruit, but the good fruit. And it's interesting that Paul right at the end says there is no law against these things. And what's really amazing is if you actually live like this, you actually don't need the law. You know, the law itself is all about fixing wrong behavior or deterring certain behaviors. Or if you're actually following this way, there's, there's no, no need for the law because you're actually following God's design. And that's why often you actually find people who are followers of Jesus and commit themselves totally to him are not often standing in front of a judge in a court or are not, are not often being pulled over by the police or, or being charged by the police because often people who live with the fruit of the Spirit as the produce actually are good people and are good people in our community who have high ethics and morals. And you've heard the conversation all the time, well, they're a good person. And particularly for followers of Jesus, they fit in that category in a generalized speaker. I'm not saying no one falls, <laughs> okay, but generally that's the case. And it's interesting that this last attribute of the fruit of the spirit of self-control is one really that, that combats so many of the evilness that we've just read of the sinful nature. Self-controlled almost is, is really that one that if we all practice, things would be so much different. Self-control, as the online dictionary would say, is the ability to control oneself, particularly one's emotions and desires, especially in difficult situations. Basically, this is the, uh, the, the, one of the, the backbones of the Christian faith of, is self-control, to restrain ourselves from certain acts of behavior. Things like sexual immorality, drunkenness, idolatry, hatred, brawling, gossiping, witchcraft, fits of right, all those different things that we've mentioned as the, 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 the sinful nature. Often self-control is a big part of that. 
We know that the lack of self-control gets us into trouble, yes? We know that. And uh, not only do we know that in this time and age, in biblical days it was the same thing. The, the writer of Proverbs says a person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. Or the message translation says a person without self-control is like a house with its doors and windows knocked out. Imagine that. No protection, no barrier. Vulnerable to the attack of the enemy because of this lack of self-control. See, self-control actually reinforces a person. It builds a wall of defense around them and shields them. It's like a shield of faith deflecting the power of the enemy. Today, there is example after example after example of people who have lost self-control and done things that have caused all sorts of grief. And dare I say, even death. You've just got to turn the news on. Drunk driving ends in fatalities. The one-hit punch, losing your temper, losing anger, losing that self-control, and that one punch can change your life forever. Drug overdose, adultery, sexual misconduct. You, you name just about any crime that you see in the news or on the TV these days, it will often come back to the person who had no self-control allowed themselves to get to a point where they went too far and did something they probably shouldn't have done. The Bible is also full of many examples of people who lacked self-control. One of the classic ones that we've looked at a number of times, but again I want to look at today, is King David. King David, who in the book of Acts we actually read, is a man after God's own heart. We read this, and God removed Saul, replaced him with David, a man whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, to be a man in my own heart. So this is a guy who we know God had chosen for a particular season to be king, a man after his own heart, who God had blessed him with everything, and yet by a simple act of lack of self-control, brought all sorts of disaster and trauma to himself. In the book of 2 Samuel, we read these words. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of his palace. As he looked over the city, he noticed a woman, unusually beautiful beauty, taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he, and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent the message to get her, and when she came to the place, he slept with her. Lord, we pray, whoever that ambulance is going to, that you just bless them and be with the people that uh, they're working on, we pray. So David, a man after God's own heart, in a moment of lust and lack of self-control, does the unthinkable. And the story even gets worse because we know that there's murder involved in it too. <laughs> lack of self-control brings all forms of disaster. The apple didn't fall too far from his son, Solomon. And this is the amazing thing. Solomon was the wisest man on earth, right? The wisest man on earth. And yet through lack of self-control when it came to relationships, crazy. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammonite, Edom, Siddim, and from among the Hittites. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. He had 700 wives of royal birth, 300 concubines, and in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. It does my head in. He's the wisest man on earth. <laughs> Over a thousand relational stuff that's going on. Now, we don't know even how to begin to unpack any of that. But through lack of self-control when it came to relationships, he made some really crazy, crazy decisions. And I want to suggest that the thing is it's not just folk from biblical times, it's folk that happen today that through lack of self-control and particularly around relationships and sexual stuff, there's a whole bunch of stuff that causes grief. And see, Paul knew this when he was walking this earth. 
And he knew particularly the lack of self-control when it came to relations. And he actually makes the comment in 1 Corinthians. He says this, do not, and talking about husbands and wives, this is a husband-wife relationship. He says, do not provide each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourself more completely to prayer. Afterwards, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. In other words, keep sexual intimacy in the marriage bed and don't open yourself up to be tempted by the enemy. And I want to suggest today that this sexual misconduct is one of the biggest areas that Satan uses to trap people today. The lack of self-control in the bedroom continues to be destructive and destroying lives more than ever before. In fact, even this week, a friend of mine, shared with me that he is separating from his wife because he was unfaithful to her. Crazy stuff. And the thing is, in talking with him today, this week, the thing that he doesn't get is he goes, I don't even know why. This issue of self-control is so vital and important. The attribute of self-control is vital in our daily walk with Jesus. And we live in a world where we're constantly bombarded with all sorts of sinful nature and temptation. Not only do we have things like sex and lust and, and pornography, there's issues like our anger and our temper that we can actually just go too far and lose self-control. And here's the one that we don't have time to unpack fully, but speech in our tongue. Imagine the things that we have said that we shouldn't because we've lost control, particularly when we're angry, particularly even as a parent, when the kids are tired and the kids have said something and you've said something when you've lost control. What about relationships? What about our finances? What about just cheating and stealing? What about food, the self-control, addictions? Basically, you name it, there can be an issue around self-control. And the truth is we need to have self-control in these areas. We need to throw off the sin that entangles us and continue to focus on God. Paul reminds us this, that since you have heard about Jesus and have learnt the truth that comes from him, throw off the old sinful nature and your formal way of life, which is corrupt by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on a new nature, created to be like God, true righteousness and holy. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbours the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you're a thief, quit, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work, and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own. He's guaranteed that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So we're a new creation in Christ Jesus, and we're meant to be producing the fruit of the Spirit, including that of self-control. We're meant to be putting away the bitterness, the rage, the anger, the heart, all the stuff, and actually acknowledge that we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. And this is something that's not just easy because we've got to walk with Jesus on a daily basis. We've got to go in training in our relationship with Jesus and keeping Jesus in, uh, in, 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 our, in our lives in the sense that he is always number one. You know, Paul makes the comment that when we toe on training, we have to train. He says, do you not know that those who run a race, um, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the game exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive the perishable reef, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it a slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. In other words, 
walking with Jesus on a daily basis requires discipline and self-control. And we need more and more, like never before, the fruit of the spirit of self-control in our lives today. Self-control is essential for anyone who wants to pursue any worthy goal. And I want to suggest that also as we walk with Jesus daily. You know, Paul again reminds uh, Titus in his letter to him in Titus chapter 1. As he was leading a church in, in Crete, um, it was a, basically a place where there was a lot of uh, worldliness and, and evil. And he speaks about um, those who want to take up a leadership position in the church. And he says to Titus in Titus 1, a church leader is a manager of God's household, so he must live a blameless life. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. He must not be a heavy drinker, violent or dishonest with money. Rather, he must enjoy having good guests in his home and he must love what is good. He must live wisely and be just. He must live a devout and disciplined life. The NIV puts it, Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Very clearly, a person who wants to be any form of spiritual leader, there must be a sense of self-control within their lives. And often that can only come by staying connected with Jesus. Again, if you don't hear anything I've said today or even through this whole series, I want you to hear this again. As we walk in our relationship with Jesus and stay connected with him, by default, the fruit of the Spirit is produced. This is not a to-do. We don't sit back and go, gee, I wish I could do this better. I wish I could love better or be patient or do that. It's not about trying to be better. It's about walking better in our relationship with Jesus, staying connected with him. As a mission here, our church is, is to help people to be connected with Jesus. And it's not just to be help people to be connected with Jesus, but to be stay connected with him and then be producers of the fruit of the Spirit. Again, Timothy remind, Paul reminds us in Timothy. He says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. This issue of self-discipline is vital for those who are followers of of Jesus. And Jesus and Peter even speaks more into this when he talks about what the virtues of following Jesus is all about, what it should look like. And he says this in first Peter, sorry, second Peter chapter one. He says, By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. So God's given us all. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he's given us a great and precious promise. These are the promises that enable us to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with generous provisions of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patience, endurance, and patience, endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God's called and chosen. Do these things and you'll never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord, Jesus, Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. As followers of Christ, we're to make every effort to have goodness and knowledge and self-control, patience, endurance, goodness, uh, godliness and brotherly kindness or affection and love. These are just some of the attributes that we're to take on with the fruit of the Spirit. We're to make every effort to add these things to our lives. You know, and we don't have time at the moment, but I'd love to be able to go through every aspect of the Sermon on the Mount because what Jesus speaks over in the Sermon on the Mount basically also could be summed up with the fact that we need to be self-controlled. 
You know, he says in Matthew, which is one of the things, and you've heard me say this many times, you've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for it. But I tell you, do not resist the evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. I don't know about you, but that requires a lot of self-control. And a lot of what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount is he says, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. In other words, there's a better way of doing this, but it requires God's presence in your life and bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Don't just do what the default setting is, what Jesus is saying. He's saying there's a better way, and that's having the Holy Spirit empower us to be his hands, feet, and voice. And see, this is exactly what Jesus did. In our Bible reading today, we read these words. When he came near the place where the road goes down to Mount Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully praising God in loud voices, for all the miracles they had seen. And then we read verse 8. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace on heaven and glory in the highest. Now check this out, right? Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And I tell you, and he says, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Just think about this for a moment. Think about the power that Jesus has right at this moment. That if the crowd stopped, stones would cry out. Jesus has the presence of the Father with him. We've seen the miracles that he's been doing up to this point, and yet as he enters into Jerusalem, we actually read that he just allows himself, allows himself to, as we heard the other day, gently riding on a donkey. But he actually reads in verse um, 22 that Jesus had authority and yet he allowed this thing to happen. In verse 22, in chapter 22 of Luke, it says that Jesus withdrew a stone throw beyond them. He knelt down to pray and he said, Father, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. So as Jesus entered into this week of, of, of the cross, basically, he's entering this week knowing that he's come to the cross, he had all the authority and power of God. That even rocks would cry out. But he gets to the point where he, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, And he knows what's about to come, and yet he says, not my will, God, but yours be done. And the angels came and strengthened him. I want to suggest that they strengthened him with not only his presence, but also gave him self-control. Imagine for a moment that you had all the power to stop it just like that, but you're falsely accused, you're beaten, you're stripped of your clothes, you're nailed to a cross, and you're left to die. How many of us would go, yeah, let that happen to me, even though you could stop it with a click of your fingers? We see it clearly. Jesus says this in Matthew 26 when basically um, Judas is coming and uh, they're about to arrest him and uh, 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 Peter's pulled pulled out the sword. And we read these words, my friend, go ahead, do what you've come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus, arrested him, but one of the men pulled out a sword and struck the high priest, slashing off his ear. Put away your sword, Jesus said. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. And get this in verse 53 of Matthew chapter 26. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for a thousand angels to protect us and he would send them instantly? In other words, I could stop this at any point. I could change this at any point. But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that decrees what must happen? Can I suggest today, if we had the power of God as Jesus did as he physically walked this earth, would we be walking in self-control? Imagine if you had the power to do all the things that Jesus did. Would you allow a friend to go through suffering or pain? Would you allow a family member to die of a sickness? Would you allow a child to suffer? There's so much that we would do if we had this power. And I want to suggest that Jesus 
was fully in self-control. He, he controlled everything that he was doing because what we read here in John 5 is that Jesus only ever did what the Father asked him to do. In John 5 we read, So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father do. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he's doing. As we are heading into this week of Easter, Jesus showed incredible self-control in allowing himself to be beaten, to be accused falsely, to be taken to the cross and nailed to the cross. He had the authority to call the angels to stop it at any point, and yet he did that because he loves you and I so much and because he did what the Father asked him to do. As we prepare for this season of Easter, we need to acknowledge that this is God's plan. And Jesus, although had the authority to stop things, to call his Father, to bring a change, he continued to pray, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And we know that the will of the Father was that his son would die and rise again so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. My prayer as we head into this holy week, that we would actually not only be producers of the fruit of the Spirit, that would be a church of the fruit of the Spirit, where we are showing love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That as we're being the hands and feet and voice of Jesus, by default, this is the fruit that is growing within our lives. Let me pray. Father God, again, I thank you for your word this morning. Lord, I thank you that you yourself are an example of self-control. That, Lord, although you could have changed things, you submitted yourself by praying, not your will, not my will, but your will be done. And, Father, I pray that for all of us here this morning, that we could pray a similar prayer, that it wouldn't be about what we want, but it will always be about what you want. That, Lord, as we stay connected with you and, and walk with you, then by default the fruit of the Spirit would be a result that we bear. That we would be more loving, more joyful, more peaceful, more patient, more kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Lord, I pray that and speak that over us as a church today. And pray that you would continue to minister to us throughout this week. And until we return again on Friday, we pray that you watch over and protect us in Jesus' name. Amen.